Well, hi, everyone, and greetings from northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. Last week, we talked about the Saros cycle and the solar eclipse. As promised, this week, we're going to continue our discussion of the Saros cycle and how it affects the lunar eclipses. So let's cue up the music and get going. Well, before we get into the meat of this video, I'd like to respond to some fan mail that I got. This is in the form of a comment from a gentleman by the name of Larry on one of my earlier videos in this series. And he took exception to a couple of the things that I talked about. Let's go over them real quick, because I'm always eager to receive correction if I put out some wrong information. Larry raises an exception to the fact that I said that there are two eclipse seasons per year. And this was related to the ascending and descending nodes in the Sero cycles. He has a little bit of a point with this in that they're not always in a fixed month. I happen to mention January and July, I believe it was, but they do rotate through as the nodes process. Let me show you what I mean. Now, these are the lunar and solar eclipses for the last few years. You'll notice that we have one eclipse season in this year in 2004 in April and May and another in October. Then we have April, and October again the next year, March and September, March, August and September. So you see, they are about six months apart and they do slowly process. So my statement that there are generally two eclipse seasons per year is correct. And Larry is correct in saying that they do kind of rotate a little bit and process through the year. So I'll accept that. And then, of course, he brings up a couple of exceptions, and that's fine. And we just talked about a few of those. Then he says 31 arc seconds angular size for the sun and the moon. He is correct there. I misspoke. It was 31 arc minutes, or about half of a degree. Then he brings up a few questions about some of the terms that I used. I use the generic term apogee and perigee. Now, when you're dealing with specific bodies, sometimes those terms have special names. And as he correctly points out, it's aphelion and perihelion when you're talking about the Earth's orbit around the sun. Now, properly, you would use another term when discussing the moon's orbit around the Earth. However, given the rather broad strokes that I was painting this presentation in, that is a distinction that I chose not to make. And then he finishes up with some insults directed at me. And that's okay. You put good information in your post, Larry, and I appreciate the corrections, and you demonstrated yourself to be a jerk. We are what we are. But let's go ahead and take a quick look at Larry's YouTube channel. Now, Larry has a relatively small channel, about 487 subscribers. Now, this may be due to his mercurial personality and the way he talks to people in the comments, but I did have a look at a few of his videos here. They are excellent. And if you would like some good information about eclipses and astronomy that is presented very accurately and with some detail, I would suggest that we stop by here. Go ahead and say, Bob the Science Guy sent me, and drop him a sub. Let's see if we can get him up over a thousand. I think Team Bob can do that. So now on to the Saros cycle and lunar eclipses. Now, an important concept that we got from our initial discussion on the Saros cycle is that the moon has three distinct orbital periods. These orbital periods all undergo what we call precession. Now, this is an example of precession right here. You notice on one particular orbit of the moon, it's in this general shape. As the moon's orbit precesses, it goes to a different shape. It maybe goes to this shape right here. And then this continues around 360 degrees over about 18 years. There are three distinct orbital periods of the moon. Now, the first one is called the syndotic month, and that is new moon to new moon. And that takes 29.53 days. The second has to do with the shape of the orbit of the moon. There's a period where the moon is closest to the Earth, called the perigee, and when it's farthest away, which is called the apogee. Now, if you go from perigee to perigee, that's called the anomalistic month, and it's about two days less than the syndotic month. It comes in at 27.55 days. And again, 
This processes around about every 18 and a half years. Now, the final orbital period of the moon has to do with the fact that the moon's orbit is offset from the ecliptic plane by about five degrees. There are only two times the descending and the ascending nodes when the moon's orbit crosses the ecliptic plane. Now, the Dracotic month is the ascending node to ascending node period of the moon's orbit, and it's about 27.2 days. So it's even shorter yet. Again, like the other two orbital periods, this processes about once every 18 and a half years. Now, if you multiply these all together and get a common denominator, it's going to take between 230 and 260 of these cycles to form one Cero cycle. Now, while I didn't think that this needed to be clarified in the original presentation, some people made some comments suggesting that I should perhaps clarify it just to avoid confusion in certain groups. This is clearly the orbit of the moon. This is not the orbit of the sun. Now that's just drawn for illustration purposes. The sun, of course, doesn't orbit the earth. It's way off 93, 94 million miles away in the distance. The plane of that yellow circle is the ecliptic plane, and that's what's being used for illustration purposes here. It does not suggest that the sun orbits the earth on the level of the moon. I honestly didn't think that I would have to clarify that, but some people felt that there may be some confusion about that. So there it is. Now in the Cero cycle, there are 223 synodic months. Those are the new moon to new moon. There are 235 anomalistic months, and that's perigee to perigee. And there are 243 draconic months, which are node to node. All of these add up to 6,585 days and about eight hours. They vary from seven hours to about 12 or almost 13 hours. Now, the effect of the Cero cycle is that you get subsequent eclipses that have similar geometry. Now, let me show you this diagram right here. Here we have a total lunar eclipse on the 14th of September in 1932. And this is Cero cycle number 136. Notice the path that the moon takes in relationship to the umbra, the penumbra, and the ecliptic plane. 18 years later in 1950, we see a very similar path. Again, in 1968, 1986, 2004, and we'll have one in this same cycle in 2022. Notice how the date kind of moves forward a little bit, and there are very subtle changes in the path of the eclipse in relationship to the ecliptic. This has to do with factors beyond the Cero cycle, specifically the wobble of the Earth, the wobble of the Moon, etc. Now, as you recall, the solar eclipse has a very small area of totality on the Earth. Now, as Larry pointed out, I misspoke myself last time when I said that that was six miles wide. It's actually 60 to 70 miles wide, and that's the north-south dimension. Now, if the eclipse occurs at solar noon, you will essentially have a circular shadow directly underneath it on the Earth. If the eclipse occurs closer to sunrise or sunset, you will get an elongation of this shadow due to the position of the sun and it can elongate into an eclipse as long as 160 to 170 miles. This is why the duration of totality at any given spot can vary a little bit. It can be as short as two minutes, or it could be as long as six or eight minutes. Now, unlike a solar eclipse, which is in a very small area, you can see a lunar eclipse anywhere it's dark. Now, like the solar eclipse, the lunar eclipse shifts position due to that eight hours, 120 degrees every cycle. So in the first eclipse in 1932, we're on the east coast of Africa. The second eclipse in 1950 is shifted 120 degrees to the west to South America. The third eclipse in 1968, another 120 degrees, and we're kind of getting over by Japan. Finally, in the fourth eclipse, you're back near the east coast of Africa. Not exactly as you can see, but getting pretty close. That's the repeating cycle. And you notice in the South America and the Japan one, 
it's also shifted a little bit to the east, so it's not quite 120 degrees. So here's the total lunar eclipse of 2019 on January 21st. Now, here's the ecliptic in the center of the umbra of the Earth. This is the penumbra of the Earth out here. Now, a lunar eclipse can occur when the moon passes within 17 degrees of the center of the Earth's umbra. Now, if the moon just kisses the penumbra, we get a penumbral eclipse. If it goes partially through the Earth's umbra, we'll get a partial lunar eclipse. And if it goes completely through the umbra, we get a total lunar eclipse. Now, this eclipse was part of Saros series number 134, and it was the 27th out of 72 eclipses in that series. If you want to look back 18 years and 11 days, you would see the previous eclipse in this series. Let's go ahead and have a look at that one. The first eclipse of the 21st century occurred exactly 18 years and 11 days and eight hours earlier. And that was on January 9th, 2001. It was part of Cero cycle number 134, and it was listed as the 26th of 73 eclipses. I don't know why there's a difference between 72 and 73, but the number of the eclipse is actually consistent between the two sources. Now, if you look at the geometry of the eclipse, you'll see it's exactly the same. But instead of being over Michigan, it was over Saudi Arabia. That's 120 degrees to the east because it progressed that 120 degrees due to the eight hours of the Saros cycle to fall over North America. Now, the interesting thing about both lunar eclipses, as, as expected, within two weeks of the lunar eclipse, there was at least a partial solar eclipse somewhere in the world. Now, in 2001, there were a total of five eclipses. We had the total lunar eclipse that we're looking at on January 9th. There was a total solar eclipse in June, a partial lunar eclipse in July, about two weeks after the solar eclipse, and then there were solar and lunar eclipses in December. So the two eclipse seasons were centered around December and June. Now, if you look at the 2019 eclipse, you'll see similar eclipse seasons. In January, we had a partial solar eclipse and the total lunar eclipse. Then in July, we had solar and lunar eclipses, and again in December. This is very similar to the cycle back in 2001 because they're part of the same Soros cycle. The other thing that I want to point out that's pretty obvious now is that if you have a lunar eclipse, there will be a solar eclipse two weeks before or two weeks after. This is because the nodes are lined up with the ecliptic plane. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I've had a lot of fun doing this series on eclipses. It's actually sparked an interest in astronomy in me. I've spent the last couple of weeks sitting out on my back porch looking at constellations and trying to pick them out and identify them. I actually bought my first telescope not long ago, and I hope to be making some observations with it. Who knows? Perhaps we'll end up with a video or two on some of those subjects as well. But in the meantime, this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thank you very much for stopping by my channel today. Please take a moment and hit that little like and subscribe button down there. Remember, we have some memberships for the channel. We also have a Patreon if you'd like to support us a little bit. In the meantime, thank you very much for stopping by, and I hope to have you on Team Bob. Take care, my friends.